Welcome to the Atheist Experience. I'm your host, Russell Glasser, and with me today is Jen Peoples. Hi, how you doing? I'm good. Uh, also with me today will be a special guest that I'll introduce in a minute on the phone lines. Um, today is Sunday, April 21st, 2013. We are a live call-in public access atheist television show based in Austin, Texas, and dedicated to promoting positive atheism and the separation of church and state. We are available through live streaming video at ustream.tv. The official Atheist Experience website is www.atheist-experience.com. Uh, you can give feedback by commenting on the official show blog at freethoughtblogs.com slash AXP or email us at tv at atheist-community.org. If you enjoy this show, you should also check out uh, our sister podcast, Godless Bitches. You can find links to that at the Atheist Experience website as well. And as always, the cast and crew of the Atheist Experience will be going to dinner after the show at Threadgills at 301 West Riverside Drive. And we'll arrive at around 6 p.m. Uh, one announcement to make, uh, next month on Sunday, May 5th, will be the grand opening of the Atheist Community of Austin Library, and it will, uh, it will also be the 2013 election of the ACA board members. The election will start at 12.15, and an open house will follow at 1 o'clock. And you can also check the website for details on that. All right. So, uh, on the line we have Dale McGowan, I hope. Are you still there? I'm here. Great. Uh, Dale McGowan is the editor and co-author of Parenting Beyond Belief and Raising Freethinkers and author of the newly released Atheism for Dummies. He teaches non-religious parenting workshops across North America and is the founding executive director of the Foundation Beyond Belief. Uh, a, human, a humanist charitable organization, and in 2008, Dale was named Harvard Humanist of the Year and lives, with, lives near Atlanta with his wife, Becca, and their three children. How are you doing today, Dale? Real good. How about you guys? Great. Doing great. Glad to have you on the show. Yeah. Um, I've been looking forward to this topic because uh, Jen and I are the only parents who are regulars on the show. And uh, we get email all the time asking for uh, co asking complicated questions about uh, how to raise their kids. <laughs> and I'm sure you know better than anyone that those aren't easy questions to answer. Yeah. Um, so what, uh, what inspired you to write uh, a book about parenting? Well, I was inspired by the need for it, uh, mostly. When, when my kids were young, especially when my firstborn was, you know, getting to be three or four, I started running into the issues and uh, went looking for resources to answer some of the questions that I had and uh, found nothing, which was astonishing to me. I couldn't believe that there were three or four major titles out on Jewish parenting. There were scores of Christian parenting books. 17 gazillion Christian books. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Islamic parenting, you know, the whole thing. Right. Uh, but I wasn't able to find anything. Well, and, and, you know, certainly secular parenting books. Yeah, but that's not the same right. as specifically parenting from the non-religious perspective. Right. So what would you say are the special challenges that needed to be addressed as far as, as, far as uh, raising kids when you're an unbeliever? Well, there's really no end <laughs> to the list, uh, but it partly depends on what your own situation is. Um, some people, uh, if you're living in the rural south, you're going to have a different set of issues from somebody living in Chicago or New York. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, generally, the um, uh, one of the main issues that you have to deal with first is the question of whether you are raising atheists or uh, uh, or if you're raising free thinkers. I think that's probably one of the clearest ways to put it. Okay. Uh, once you decide that, a lot of the other issues. Um, uh, start to clarify themselves. You can start to see how to uh, how to get at them. Well, but uh, aside, once you sort of establish that, you move on to the question of religious extended family. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the big ones that people deal with. How can you raise a child uh, to make their own decisions in terms of worldview when the extended family they're in is uh, primarily religious? You know, that's probably the next yeah. big issue that people uh, confront. Yeah. It, well, yeah. Well, I was going to say it's it's interesting because that's the thing I think that drives a lot of people to email us, is that they've got family members who are doing their best to indoctrinate the children over the parents' yeah. objections, or sometimes the parents are not completely open about their non-belief, and so as a result, you know, the the children are at risk of being indoctrinated, and the parents write to us saying, "What do I do? How do I handle this?" That's right. So, so what do you recommend in those kind of situations? Well, one of the first things I recommend is that the parents should be open about their unbelief, at least to the child. Right. Um, that I, but once in a while I have somebody come to me and say, you know, I'm so concerned, so worried about indoctrinating uh, and, you know, avoiding that, that uh, I haven't even told my child what I believe. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a mistake. Me I think too. you have to be forthright with it, you have to say, this is what I believe, but I want you to look at the evidence, look at various points of view, you are going to make up your own mind on this, and I will love you no less. Right. Uh, so that's, that's a starting point. Uh, beyond that, um, it's a matter of addressing it quite directly, especially with any relatives you have who are um, creating a, uh, a direct pressure. Um, if you have somebody who is literally, you know, like you said, trying to indoctrinate the child, that's not okay. That's getting in the way of your own parental rights. It's certainly getting in the way of the rights of the child as well. Uh, so what you have to do is sit down and have a conversation uh, with uh, a relative who's doing this. Right. But there are ways to do it um, in a way that is not um, going to put, make the person defensive it's not going to uh, make them feel that it's a win-lose situation. Um, and so I talk about this in the workshops very much. Uh, oh, that, that's interesting, because I, I usually advise people, you know, it's your damn kid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. you tell your relatives what's what. Uh, but, but it sounds like you've got a more diplomatic solution on hand. Well, it's one that um, it's based on the concept of nonviolent communication, which is something that Marshall Rosenberg and some others have uh, spelled out, mm -hmm. it's an extremely effective way to have a conversation that reduces tension between people uh, by not setting up this win-lose dichotomy. Um, in the process, you don't give anything up. I mean, I'm not saying go into this mm -hmm. and go to the relative and say, okay, let's see how we can find a middle ground between letting the child think for themselves and having you scare them with hell. <laughs> you know, that's not, we're not looking for a middle ground there. Uh, what I'm looking for is uh, an opportunity to say, this is the parenting that we uh, have chosen to do with the child. Let's talk about ways that we can involve you in the child's religious education. You know, let them know what you think. But ultimately, we're going to have to come to an agreement that um, our child is going to make his or her mind up independently. Mm -hmm. um, and the way you do this is by uh, honoring the person in whatever ways you can uh, by saying things that are true. You know, for example, if I were to go to my mother-in-law, who is quite lovely, <laughs> frankly, she hasn't been a problem in this area, but if I went to her and said, I want to have this conversation with you because you're important to our family. You know, this, and we want to have a good relationship with you and your grandchildren. Um, and we know that the religious questions have been a concern to you, so we really wanted to sit down and address this directly. Um, you empathize with the person. You don't say, 
what the hell's wrong with you? Why are you so concerned about this? You know, you can say, I understand how you feel. I think if I were in your position, I might feel exactly the same. Um, That allows the person to sort of open up and uh, listen to what you have to say next. And then you say, my concern is that Jennifer is allowed to make up her own mind on this, but the only way she can do that is by hearing many points of view. And I would like to have an opportunity for her to sit down with you and me. We'll have a cup of hot chocolate, and I'd like you to share what you believe. So uh, you don't if, you don't unloose them on the kid by themselves <laughs> in well, an see, unmoderated the, environment. That's the issue. That's exactly right. What you do is you sort of take the initiative and say, I want you to be able to talk to the child, but then you create this opportunity that circumvents the need for them to do it in a sneaky way. Okay. Um, this, this is the sort of thing, I've talked to so many people who've tried this, and it has opened up uh, the dialogue, it has reduced the tension, and it's put the child in a position to, well, one of the things you have to say, it's going to be okay for the child to ask whatever questions they want. Mm-hmm. You, that's, that's a non-negotiable thing. And what the relative will very frequently do is um, be so grateful for being included in this um, situation that they will consent to that. Okay. And uh, what, comes, what comes through in terms of the long-term relationship, the family relationship after this discussion happens, is really an extraordinary thing. There can be a lot of, a lot of um, cooperation where there had just been this sort of butting of heads. It doesn't solve all the problems, but it's amazing what it opens up. Great. Um, do you deal much with, uh, with parents in mixed marriages, basically? Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, I, I actually uh, saved an email that a caller sent, that, a, that somebody sent us a couple of weeks ago, uh, and I thought it would be a good thing to, to read to you. Uh, can I? May I? Uh, yeah, that would be fine. Could I say something else first? Oh, sure. I'm actually getting a delayed echo it's Ah. quite loud and it's hard for me to focus okay (laughs) hey control room get on that (laughs) uh and you you don't have us streaming while you're calling do you no okay okay good uh all right well i hope that it'll be fixed by the time i finish reading this and then uh i guess a little later we'll get to your other book um okay let's see Uh, So this is Daniel writing in, and he says, I'm a parent of three young boys ages three months to four years. I used to be an Orthodox Hasidic Jew, although I was raised in a fairly traditional secular Jewish home. I've been an atheist for two and a half years now. My wife and our religious community where I live know I'm an atheist. I am open about my beliefs, but while I am with my family or in the community, I practice many Jewish rituals, such as wearing a yarmulke, Keeping, keeping kosher, don't work on Sabbath and holidays, etc. Partly for my wife's sake, who is still an Orthodox Jew. And in part, I still do get some nostalgic pleasure from performing these things from time to time. My wife respects my views, but we are sending our kids to a private Jewish school. Right now, uh, they, the younger two, are too young to uh, understand the concept of God, while the oldest one gets the idea of God, basically, that God is invisible but everywhere and that he can do anything and is a good guy, and that's about the extent of it. How do you think a person in my situation should approach the idea of God with their kids and when? My plan is basically to tell them that I don't believe in God when the subject comes up. So, for instance, if they ask me a question about God or his actions, or if they make a statement referring to God but request my opinion. I tried to gauge my my son's understanding of concepts like pretend. He knows that when he is acting like a superhero or an animal, he's pretending. But when I ask him about movies or shows he sees and ask him things like, uh, ask him things if he sees like dragons, fairies, etc. are real or pretend he insists they are real. I figure the time to reveal my doubt to him would be the time when he starts to understand that things he hears in stories and movies aren't always real and are sometimes pretend. 
Is that a good approach? Is there a better alternative in your opinion? I personally would rather not force my opinions on my children. I would answer questions on things and if appropriate, give them my perspective, but I would like to teach them to think for themselves and to be inquisitive as far as I'm able. I know that my children are really young, but I would like to think about how I should deal with this situation ahead of time. Your thoughts? Wow. <laughs> it's a lot to unpack there. It's a lot to unpack, but uh, at the same time, it's very impressive. Um, I'm actually going to turn off my earpiece because the echo is getting to me, but um, uh, and just answer in the mic. Uh, so if you ask me a question, I won't hear for a minute. <laughs> um, well, I guess you can't see us right now either, huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, I can pull you up. Let's see. Okay. 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 It just I'm getting the loud echo that sounds like it's in the room with you, but I... Um, okay. <sighs> I, I'm sorry. Don't know what's wrong. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. All right, go ahead. Okay. Uh, several things that he said uh, indicate that he's in just about an ideal situation, frankly. Mm -hmm. First of all, his wife respects his views. That's fantastic. Um, that's not the case for a lot of people. Uh, secondly, he's coming from a Jewish perspective. Um, it's in the Jewish, um, uh, in the Jewish religion, uh, humanistic Judaism, uh, you know, atheistic, essentially, uh, uh, Jewish culture uh, is accepted to the point that it's actually now one of the five branches of Judaism. It is an official branch of the religion. Uh, so unlike a lot of other religious uh, situations, um, he's actually in a position in a community that at least has some uh, ability to um, um, process the presence of uh, someone who is non-theistic among them. It's actually uh, woven into the, uh, into the religion. So that's, that's good. Uh, now, his children are going to a Jewish school. Uh, there's a lot of variability depending on whether it's an Orthodox school, uh, whether it uh, is a Reformed Jewish school, and so on. Um, but the situation that he's in is um, all he needs to do, and all I recommend for parents who are in this, uh, in this situation and some who are, even, you know, who are not in quite as good a situation, um, if a child hears two clearly articulated uh, opinions in terms of worldview, and if those two opinions are held in mutual um, uh, respect, not the opinions themselves, but the right of the two people to hold them, um, that is an in incredibly powerful situation for the child to be in. So you've got the wife who is uh, still uh, practicing uh, theistic Jew, and you have a husband who is a non-theistic cultural Jew, uh, the child sees the two people respecting each other, even as they differ profoundly in their, uh, in their actual beliefs. That is a child who's in an ideal situation. They have the invitation from both sides to think for themselves, and they have um, the um, articulated worldview of one person and another. If the child sees at least two worldviews articulated in that way, then they realize, I see it's a choice. This is something that I get to work out for myself. And uh, you don't have to do anything magic. You don't have to do anything special. I think the idea of waiting until the child brings it up themselves or it comes up naturally is perfectly good. Um, if there's another situation where the child seems troubled or is you know, grappling with uh, something that... Uh, he or she heard at school. That's another time he can step in. But really, it sounds to me like this situation is uh, is pretty close to ideal. Um, I actually, frankly, I um, worry a little bit uh, when uh, sometimes parents are in a situation where they both have the same perspective, whether it's religious or non-religious. Then you actually have to go outside of the home to give them that breadth of exposure to ideas. But in this mm -hmm. case, he's actually got it built in. So I really think it's a good situation. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, I was just going to comment that, you know, in this email, the guy talks about his children being pretty young. And I think yeah. one of the things that um, we have to be cautious about is expecting children to be able to, to do too much too soon. And so, you know, a four-year-old isn't necessarily in a position to tell whether something um, is real or imaginary. 
And you can, yes. you know, you can start that game with them and, and help guide them on that path where they, they're dealing with reality and, and trying to make those judgments. But, you know, if the kid consistently thinks that, you know, SpongeBob is real and the Polar Express is real and stuff like that, it, at that age, that's not a big deal. You know, that's nothing to get excited about. Absolutely normal, right. Yeah, so, you, you know, you just keep having those conversations. And the one thing I always advocate, especially when parents say, hey, my kid is getting exposed to religious ideas at school, he's getting exposed through family members or whatever, and, and I always advise parents to take control of that conversation um, by deliberately exposing the child to different religious thoughts. And I started my son with Greek and Roman mythology <laughs> as a way of starting the inoculation process. Perfect. And that's the right word, too. I really think that's an ideal word. Yeah. You know, I can't help thinking that as atheists we have kind of an advantage over uh, over Christian parents because, um, you know, skepticism is our friend. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I've heard I, I've heard Todd Friel on the Way of the Master radio show go into a rant about what a bad thing Veggie Tales has been for Christianity because yeah. it's sort of an animated show that talks about Bible stories, and then he says, "Well, when kids get older and they realize that Veggie Tales isn't real, they say, well, what about all these other Bible stories yeah. I've been told? Maybe they're not real." <laughs> and <laughs> I feel like, well, yeah, that's a, you know that's a built-in problem to trying to indulge indoctrinate a kid with something that has no evidence, whereas, you know, that, yeah. Yeah, that, that actually, that brings up a very important point. Um, a lot of times I hear parents talk about, um, you know, the concerns that their children are going to be indoctrinated. Uh, it's a very real concern, mm -hmm. but it's actually much harder to indoctrinate a child uh, than to raise a free-thinking child. It is, and it's increasingly difficult for just the reason you're talking about. You have all these different ideas, all these different inputs, this, this you know, wild cultural uh, uh, melee of ideas that we've got. And you've got the Internet, you know, as the kids get older. Um, it is very difficult now for a parent to build the kind of glass wall, mm -hmm. not glass, brick wall, that yeah. you need yeah. to build around a child to achieve indoctrination. You know, so I think just what you're talking about, the fact that uh, this, uh, that, uh, this show can, can cast religious stories in a different light or something like that, those are very powerful moments. And it's one of the many, many things that makes it harder to indoctrinate a child now than it ever has been before. Right. So, so would you say in your experience, if you've got a religious parent and, a, and an atheist parent, as long as they approach it like in a non-competitive way, the atheist parent is more likely to win? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, well, I just contradicted uh, myself, but <laughs> yeah, well, I, yeah. The the thing I recommend is to to not think about it in those terms. The right. win for me is the child who makes his or her own decision. That's the win. Mm -hmm. Now, whether that child's going to end up being secular or not, um, I I really have to free myself to say, okay, here's the thing with my kids. For example, mm -hmm. I raised my kids to be honest. I raised my kids to be curious and to value the truth and to find the world wonderful, no matter what, whether God exists or God doesn't exist. I've raised them to be empathetic to others. I've raised them to be tolerant. All of these things are the basic values in which we've raised them. Now, whether they choose a secular perspective or a religious one, I'm confident that they're going to choose one that embodies those values. Mm -hmm. So the fact is, if my child comes to me and says, hey, Dad, I've decided I'm a liberal Quaker, you know, <laughs> hey, Dad, I've decided I'm a Congregationalist or something like that, yeah, sure. yeah. I think those are much more likely outcomes because that's a reflection of the values in which they were raised. If my child came to me and said, hey, guess what, I've decided I'm a snake-handling Pentecostal, <laughs> I, it could happen, but it would be flipping the values in which they were raised entirely on their head. It's a very, it's a much less likely outcome. And uh, so, you know, at some point we have to um, say the more important thing to me is the process, is an honest process, not a specific outcome that matches mine. Uh, I, I do have a counterexample for you. Uh, you know about Madeline Murray O'Hare's son? Yeah. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> well, did, I don't know much about how Madeline raised her child. 
Yeah, his, but, his name, by the way, was uh, William J. Murray, mm -hmm. and uh, I forget what what he converted to, but he became a pretty hardcore public theist, I think, is a reaction. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, here's, here's what I think happens. I don't know about her specific situation, but if an atheist parent raises the child with a very sort of doctrinaire atheism, if they make it clear to the child that um, you're going to end up like me or <laughs> I won't respect you, you're going to end up like me or, you know, I'm going to disown you or anything like that. In other words, if we behave like a fundamentalist Christian, the odds are that our child can do exactly the same thing that the children of fundamentalist Christians often do, go completely to the other end of the spectrum to right. oppose the parent. Yeah. So it's possible, I, again, I don't know the, the uh, situation with Madeline's family, but it is possible that the child at least felt that they were put in that kind of a situation and then they acted against, they rebelled against the parental authority. I've seen this over and over again. Mm -hmm. When I meet parents at a conference or something and they say, uh, my daughter was raised an atheist from the beginning. We never allowed her to see any religious ideas, uh, talk to any religious people or anything. We let her know from the beginning that religion is stupid. And then she turned 16 and now she's a door knocking evangelist. What in the world happened? <laughs> And my feeling is that you set yourself up for that when you make it too clear that um, you are giving them a, um, a choice to rebel. Right. I, I, always, um, setting, what's that? I always feel like, um, you know, it, it's... You know, it, it's not a possibility that kids will rebel when they turn te into their teenage years. It's a guarantee. <laughs> That's right. So yeah. um, if, you, if your only reason for uh, the things that you want them to do is because I said so, uh, you know, that guarantee is going to mean that they're going to turn away from you uh, or what you taught them. Whereas if you give them, you know, if you basically instill them with the values and the understanding of why they would behave one way instead of another, they they can only rebel against you so far before butting up against uh, things that they actually believe themselves. Well, see, you got it exactly right, I think. Um, if you give them the opportunity to build their own foundation, you know, the foundation of worldview that they're standing on, then just as you said, they are not as likely to rebel against something they built themselves. Mm -hmm. So you right. give them the process, you give them the opportunity, you, you keep space around them so that they can think for themselves. And then in the end, you got it exactly right, they're going to own it. It's not going to be yeah. something that they can push against. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and getting back to what you said about uh, not insulating them from other religious ideas, uh, one of the things I think that you know, as I look back on my own childhood and my own, um, you know, journey to, um, to reason, I, I think uh, about the fact that I was exposed to um, mostly just Christianity, a little bit of Judaism, but mostly just Christianity. But it was all different flavors of Christianity. Everything from, you know, um, Pentecostal, you know, Assembly of God, speaking in tongues, you know, falling down, slain in the spirit kind of things, all the way through very liberal Episcopalians. And uh, you know, I think about that, and it's like what that did was it, it exposed the fact that Christians don't even agree on their own yeah. theology. There are so yeah. many different disagreements. And I, and I know that right now there are lots of Christians who probably, you know, they'll hear this, or they maybe they've heard me talk about this before, and they'll say, oh, that's why you're an atheist. You were ex exposed to a consistent message. And huh. I would say that's exactly right. <laughs> you know, that, was, that was one of the big contributors there. That we, you know, there was no consistent message through that. And I, th and I think it's important for kids who are being raised as free thinkers to see this. You know, if oh, you go absolutely. and talk to Christians, or Muslims or anything, and they tell you, oh, this is the one true path, you're going to talk to somebody else who lays claim to the same label, and they're going to have a different true path for you. Yeah, that's a very powerful realization. The mm -hmm. one thing that I have said I don't want my kids exposed to, um, at least not exposed to it until I can sort of prepare them for it, is fear. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want, uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to be sure that we had talked about hell before they heard it on the playground when they're yep. six years old, which is if you talk to parents one after another after another, 
kids hear about hell when they're six. That's the age it typically happens, you know, okay. when they're in kindergarten or, you know, early first grade, and a peer finds out that they don't go to church, yeah. you know, in a conversation, and they say, oh, my gosh, you're going to hell. Well, what is hell? Well, hell is this place where you're going to burn forever because you don't believe in God and so on. I didn't want my kids to hear that first from someone else. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, we talked about the idea of hell, and we defused it completely. I don't play fair with hell. It's the one religious yeah. idea where I don't play fair. I laugh it to scorn, and I tell them, if God exists, God thinks it's a silly idea, too. Yeah. It's, it's just completely human. It's uh, insulting. You know, could you imagine being God and saying, you know, I'm going to burn them forever because they didn't believe in me? You know, that's just yeah, too right. egotistical. So I, I always told my kids to picture God thumping himself on the forehead, you know, face palm and saying, how did they come up with this stuff, you know? That's the one thing that I treated unfairly and got out of the way. And as a result, when my daughter, I remember my oldest daughter, when she heard it on the playground, three friends at once all gasped and said she was going to hell when they found out yeah. she didn't go to church. And she was able to tell me the story and say, well, that's silly. She was able to be very dismissive of it, which is what I wanted. It's the one religious idea I don't play fair with. Yeah, and I, I have to agree with that, and, and it's interesting because my son is seven now, and um, I think this whole idea of hell has kind of bounced off of him. And, you know, if you asked him if he even gave you an answer, he'd probably look at you like you were crazy. But if he even, if he even gave you an answer, he would probably tell you, oh, that's that thing my mom says sometimes when she steps on my Legos, <laughs> <laughs> among other things. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah, so getting back to uh, something you said earlier, I know a lot of parents are afraid that if they talk about uh, religion that they don't believe in at all. Like, let's say they're not in a mixed household, but you've got two atheists who agree with each other, and they're sometimes uh, paralyzed by the idea that they're going to be unfair to everything, and so they don't talk about atheism at all. Right. Uh, that, that's not such a good idea, right? Oh, gosh, no, it's not at all. But it is a concern. I think they actually have the right concern. It's mm -hmm. just that it's the wrong thing to do to just turn it off completely. I was in a, um, when, when uh, my wife and I got married, she was um, religious. She was uh, Baptist by descent, <laughs> her entire family. And um, I guess Presbyterian, that was the church she was primarily going to at the time. But she was definitely Christian. And for the first 13 years of our marriage, uh, she uh, considered herself Christian. Well, and she was a, always from the beginning just a, a very uh, intelligent, liberal, you know, not fundamentalist, not literalist or anything like that. Um, so we worked things out very, very well with the kids and all. Um, I actually thought it was an advantage. You know, here we've got, like I said, with the, the Jewish couple, here we've got the diversity built into the home. And both of us respect each other so that we were able to very safely say, hey, you ought to, here's what I believe, but you should talk to mom because I know she believes differently and send the kids, you know, to get these two different voices. Perfect. Well, um, about seven years ago, uh, she decided she was a secular humanist. <laughs> well, that's lovely. <laughs> but the funny thing is, the second thought I had is, oh, we just kind of lost that diversity in the home. So we actually had a, um, at that point, we were a little more vigilant of making sure that we got the kids outside of the home, got them out to hear other voices, talk to grandma, you know, go to church once in a while, go to a Sikh Gurdwara, go to a Hindu temple, you know, get those experiences outside of the home because we had lost the built-in diversity uh, a little bit. So that's what I recommend. You own what you are, you um, make it absolutely clear that the choice is theirs, and then you get them to hear other voices as well. Cool. Couldn't agree more. Uh, so, atheism for dummies, what's up with that? <laughs> <laughs> that was a ball to write. That was um, <laughs> the most fun I've had on the writing project. Um, really, it was uh, the company that does the dummies books, <laughs> Wiley. Oh, this is, uh, okay. I, I guess it didn't connect for me for a minute that this is actually an official for dummies book. <laughs> this is an official, yes, this All is right. an official Dummies book. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so they decided that the time had come culturally for there to be a book called Atheism for Dummies. And uh, they actually went to some prominent bloggers, including Hemant Mehta, 
and uh, asked for uh, recommendations for who to, you know, who would be the person to write this. And I was grateful mm -hmm. to say that he suggested me. Um, but what they do in the dummy series is for these cultural topics, they want to see that something's hot. Uh, and atheism is hot. <laughs> it's something that people are talking about now. Yes. So they decided that it's finally time to have a book that introduces the layperson to uh, atheism. And first of all, I was stunned that it didn't already exist. I couldn't believe it. 1,600 books in the dummy series. <laughs> yeah, you know, there's, uh, there are books on digital photography and gardening and philosophy and religion generally and several different um, denominations, Catholicism of, for dummies, Mormonism for dummies, the Bible A lot of for computer dummies. programming stuff. I know that yeah, for sure. Oh, gosh, yes, lots of that. Yeah. Um, there's a book called Farmville for Dummies. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Which Isn't that is redundant? Incredible. Yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but my, my favorite one, the weirdest one I found, there's a book called eBay for Canadians for Dummies. <laughs> and that was more compelling than atheism, apparently. <laughs> that had to be written before the book on the worldview that a billion people hold, you know, worldwide. Right. Um, so, um, so anyway, it was time, and they gave the project to me, and I just had a ball writing it. So is this book targeted more at, at people who are atheists or more at, uh, you know, responding to people who just don't know anything about it? This is... <clears throat> The, the dummy series is very clear about who their audience is. Um, first of all, not dummies. They make right. that clear. These are people who just want to know more about a topic they don't know much about. <laughs> um, but this, is, this was very specifically for lay people who don't know much about atheism, but they've heard about this thing and it sounds interesting. It was not intended to convince um, it's intended to describe, you know, okay. here's what but, atheism but is, you here's expect... our history, here's our literature. And for that reason, I think it really ends up um, filling a gap in the literature. Uh, huh. This is the book you can give to your, uh, your Aunt Mildred who thinks you're crazy, who doesn't know what this atheism thing is about. Um, that's the audience I had in mind. It was your Aunt Mildred. So I guess your primary audience is expected to be mostly religious. Uh, mostly either religious or, in some cases, it will be that big, fuzzy, spiritual, but not religious, ah. or it could be somebody who's non-religious but doesn't use the word atheist. And frankly, one of the nicest things is I've now heard from many scores and scores of atheists who picked up the book and said, this is great, I didn't know this stuff about oh. atheism. A year and a half of research uh, went into this and another book that I did right before it, and so it has an awful lot about atheism that a lot of atheists won't know. Uh, tell me something I don't know. Okay, tell me something I don't know. Um, did you know that Mexico once had an out atheist president? No. Wow. That's something I didn't know. In the 1920s, Plutarco Caius was an out atheist. Um, did you know that Quebec used to be the most religious province in Canada, 83% Catholic? And it is now the least religious province in Canada by almost every measure, and huh. still 83% Catholic. Wow, <laughs> Quebec, that's where our good friend Dennis Marcus lives. Yeah. Oh, You've probably gosh. run into him before. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yes. Uh, well, that is really interesting. Yeah. Jen? Uh, any, any questions? No, I, I think I'm good right now. Okay. Dale, is there anything else uh, you'd like to tell us, or should we uh, switch over to other callers? That's fine. We can go to callers. All right. Um, well, I want to thank you very much for, uh, for joining us today. And uh, so, so your three books are uh, Atheism for Dummies, Parenting Beyond Belief, and... Raising Free Thinkers. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. I've enjoyed having you on. Yep. Absolutely, Thanks. my pleasure. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Now, before we get to our next caller, I need yes. to let everybody know, if you're in the Austin area and you're hungry, oh, thanks. we're going to be going to El Arroyo, not Threadgills not today. Not Threadgills. Threadgills is actually closed today. We don't know why, or at least I don't know why. But El Arroyo, so um, I can't tell you what to do, but if you're hungry yeah. and, you know, 
The Feel address like is up there. Mix? If for some reason you can't read it on your stream, it's uh, 1624 West 5th Street. Yep. All right. Uh, Dave in New York. Yes, hi. Hi, hi Dave. We've talked to you How before, you right? Good. Yes, how are you? Thank you for taking my call. I'm good. Welcome back. Good. I have a quick question. Um, I read the book, The Late Great Planet Earth, okay. about 35 years ago. Right. It was, it was published in 1970, yes. and it became the best-selling book of the decade. Now, the purpose of the book, from what I understand, was to demonstrate that current-day events were predicted by the ancient Hebrew prophets from the Bible. Now, it describes that the generation that would see the rebirth of the nation of Israel in 1948 would see specific signs, including Russia, allied with Iran, in an adversarial relationship with Israel, a European federation of nations uh, that would have, let's say this way, uh, an economic crisis, and the nations of the world would be involved in a global unsolvable problem over the status of Jerusalem. Now, it's just a simple question. The question is, have you read the book, and if so, do you see any connection between what was written in the book, The Lake Great Planet, up in 1970 and the current world situation? I read the book probably a bazillion years ago. Oh, uh, you have? I yeah. have never read the book, so I'm going to uh, leave this one to you. I, you know, actually, I, I read it as science fiction, or as, as a fictional, like, you know, apocalyptic thing, and I, I was not really very impressed with it. Okay. Now, I'm sorry, did you say fictional? Yeah. Okay. Um, are you sure we're talking about the same book? Because yes. it's basically a documentary book where it documents the rebirth of Israel. No, no, it it's, it's not really a documentary. Okay. Okay. Now, are you familiar with what the book says is going to happen? You know, it's been a long time. But, okay. um, yeah, I, I just remember that, you know, the, the book was, that, like I said, I took it as fiction. I read it as fiction. Um, I honestly don't think we're talking so, about the same so book. So you're saying yeah, that the late book, great planet Earth. I yeah, know the exactly book was written book in 1970, about. and you're saying it predicted things that had happened in the 40s. It, well, let's put it this <laughs> way. The book, no, no, not all, no, no, follow this. The book was written in 1970. Right. And it basically connected future events with, you know, supposedly it gave a list of supposedly things that the Bible says was going to happen. Okay? Right. Now, what, what it talked about the fact, obviously, it was written in 1970. The rebirth of Israel was 1948. So it talked about the generation that would see the rebirth of Israel. Right. Obviously, so in other words, born. he retrofitted yeah. stuff that he already knew had happened and, yeah. and matched it up to things that it said in the Bible so that it could mm -hmm. sound like it, it was predicted. Well, no. He was looking actually forward from 1970. Okay. Okay. And he just referenced the rebirth of Israel in 1948. So what specific predictions with exact dates and, uh, and places uh, that weren't obvious was he able to make? Very good question. Now, what's interesting, my brother and I lecture on the subject. Twice a year, 17 okay. years in a row, we got invited to a local high school, and okay. we were able to use the blackboard. I'm sorry. Okay. No, go ahead. List, yeah, and we put a list of those predictions on the blackboard. Now... What's the best the one? <laughs> hit, hit, don't waste the time with, I mean, just hit me with your favorite. Yeah. Very, very simple. You'd have to see Iran publicly threatening to destroy Israel. You'd have to see Europe uniting into the United States of Europe. Now, wait a and minute. Have, I'm sorry. No, in 1970, the, Iran was already publicly threatening them all, all the time. I thought you said he was predicting future stuff. Right. No, actually, the, the concept is very simple. It would be Russia allied with Iran in an adversary relationship with Israel. When uh -huh. the book was written, the United States was allies with the Shah of Iran, and Russia and Iran weren't, uh, you know, having to say allies. Okay. So, th yeah, the next thing they talked about, the fact, was that Europe would unite into the United States of Europe politically, economically, and militarily. But then they'd head to a great economic crisis centered in Europe, which is, right. that's what I'm trying to point out. You, you know, know this is all account. incredibly vague stuff. I yeah. mean, talking about one country will, uh, will be allies with another country. I mean, I'd almost say that was 50-50. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, right. It, you know, and then, 
And then if you talk about at some indeterminate point in the future, I mean like 200 years from now, if somebody allied with somebody else, you could say, oh, look, this book was written a long time ago. I exactly. mean, political alliances come and go constantly. People are declaring war and threatening each other constantly. What I was asking was, does he predict anything really, really specific? It, absolutely. Now, very simple. Okay. What he says is going to happen, okay? When? Right, right what around, year? Right around the corner. This is what I'm going to give you what he's going to uh, talk about in the book, okay? And he uh -huh. relates it to the ancient Hebrew prophets. Pretty soon there's going to be a conflict Pretty between... Pretty soon? Can you be more I'm specific sorry. than that? Relatively soon. No! Basically, you're going to see a conflict between Iran and Israel, and Iran's going to yeah. make that very badly. I would, Europe look, I'm, I'm saying that it's not really very impressive to predict in 1970 that Israel's going to be fighting with Iran. Well, no, he I mean, to the I mean every Ezekiel. part of the Middle East was fighting with Israel since the 40s. 100%. Yeah. But he refers to a prophecy in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 38, right. where it talks about ancient Persia. So he's not making predictions. What he does is he connects the ancient Hebrew prophets to current day events. Now, the big thing is this yeah. that I want to point out to you, okay? is that the current situation in the Middle East, it says in the book there's going to be a global unsolvable problem where Jerusalem, the West Ooh. Bank, and the Temple Mount, the entire world's going to try to divide Jerusalem, and it's going to lead to a situation where a leader will arise in Europe and make a seven-year treaty with Israel and institute a global monetary system where they're going to be doing away with paper currency and going to barcodes and chips. Okay, and, and when is that supposed to happen? Well, Real keep in mind, now. it yeah. should happen according Real to the predictions during the generation that would see the rebirth of Israel. Okay. Right, which, as far as they were concerned back then, as I understand it, was current events, pretty much. Well, yeah. Well, basically the scenario is... I, I mean, when we're talking about a 2,000-year window where, you know, at any point in the future something might happen, this is not specific prediction. And in fact, okay. in fact Hal Lindsey, when he wrote this book... Um, his view was that this was going to happen in the 70s. Now, if you read the book, it does not uh, say that at all. No, but it's clear from, from the way he wrote it that he intended this to happen in the 70s. Oh, uh, one, well, not in the 70s, but basically it doesn't set dates at all. But what's interesting... That's well, the problem. And that's, and that's, I'm sorry. Wait, wait, I'm and sorry. you don't see a problem with that? You're okay. going to call this a prophecy, but there's no dates, there's nothing firm, it's just these vague, pretty soon now. Right. Right. I mean, you see what happens when people actually pin specific dates to their predictions, then they risk being hilariously wrong. It, like, exactly, that guy, exactly. like that guy a couple right. of years ago who said that the world was going to end on March 21st and then he yeah, became a laughing stock. It's very convenient for a guy like Hal Lindsey to just say something like, real soon now, because yeah, here it is right. 40 years later, and if it still hasn't happened, we can still say, well, real soon now could be 10 years from now. Yeah. Exactly. Now, guys, let me just give you one other quick concept. You're saying okay? exactly as if you're agreeing with my point here. Well, oh, listen, yeah. 100%. If you set dates and it doesn't happen, you're a false prophet. But okay. let me just give you something okay. real quick. But okay. if you don't set I'm any give you dates... Quick, I'm sorry. <laughs> but if you don't set any dates, there's no risk. And so I wouldn't oh, call I, that a prediction. Absolutely. absolutely. But I'm going to give you a sequence of events that will be very prominent, okay? Okay. The next, thing on the, the next thing on the prophetic list is a conflict between... Russia allied with Iran against Israel. Russia and Iran are going to make that very badly. After that, there's going to be a global economic collapse. Europe is going to unite into a ten-nation federation. A leader will arise, make a seven-year treaty with Israel. He's going to allow the Jewish people to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem that hasn't been there for 2,000 years. He's going to allow them to rebuild the temple and start animal sacrifices and institute a global monetary system where there'll be no paper currency and barcodes and chips. Now, it's interesting. You guys are going to be very familiar with this, okay? Uh, there's going to be two men sent to the city of Jerusalem, and the entire world is going to hear what they have to say. And what's interesting, they're only going to be around for three and a half years. And when they do get killed in the streets of Jerusalem, it's Revelation chapter 11, there's going to be a surge in okay. retail sales. So, like, see what happened in Boston? So when everybody <laughs> celebrated when these guys... Oh, wait a minute. Okay, oh, wait. that's convenient. So yeah. it just yeah. happened, like, a couple days ago, you're saying? Well, no, I'm giving you a comparison. No. See what happened in Has Boston, this thing happened yet? I'm sorry? This specific prediction that you're claiming uh, yeah, was th this, accurate? This sequence happened? of events, is this in the future still, or is it, has it... Oh, no, absolutely in the future. 
Oh, oh, okay. so, oh wait, so wait a minute. So this <laughs> ten member European community federation, exactly ten, mem okay. ten member European federation. No, no, wait a minute. Is going to arise and make a seven year treaty with you Israel. You realize, you realize that when this was written, this European community had six members, right? Correct. And you There's realize that it has twenty seven right. now. There's seventeen right now. No, well, I think there's more than that. No, well, there's actually the European Union, but there's seventeen in the currency union. Okay. Oh, so we're way past the 10 member. Oh, 100%. Yeah. And so, 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 he so, they, so he's thing, totally wrong. So he was taking a thing that already <laughs> existed and predicting it would get bigger. Well, let's That's put impressive. this way. The foundation document wow. of the European Union was signed in 1956. But I'm just telling you what's going to happen, according to the predictions, there'll be a final 10 nation federation. Right. It's what's going to happen to the other Okay, you go ahead. Yeah, happens. go ahead. Well, what's going to happen to the other guys? Uh, it's, well, let's put it this way. It's, it's hard to exactly say. You're talking about the other countries? Yeah. Are they just okay. going to, you know, stop they existing? Might, or they might cease to exist nationally. Let's put it that way. They might. Okay. You know, That's how bad your economy is going to get. Now that you've called twice, is there any chance that you could maybe call back after this stuff has happened instead of just calling well, and repeating you, the prediction you already? Now, um, I, I, filled, I filled this for you guys in. As a matter of fact, I sent Matt a copy. You can go to our website. Okay. My brother and I, uh, we yeah. sent out three newspapers. We wrote a newspaper in 1980, exactly 33 years right. ago. Dude, and we get, just, we just give me, you guys prove your p prophetic powers now using the Bible and Hal Lindsey. Give me a specific date in a specific year when something specific will happen and then call back. Is anything going to happen in the next five years? Well, absolutely. And you know something? I'd what? like to send you a what? copy what? of what? the newspaper. That was Tell us, what? Well, tell us Just tell us the thing One we're thing. watching out for and when. One thing okay, specifically. No well, I have, it's, it's a little bit detailed, but I can send you a copy of It's called Just The Last Trumpet. Give me the date first. April 1980. What's the date? What's the date when this thing you're predicting will happen? We, don't, we specifically don't say set dates. All right, get All right, lost. you're done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is not prophecy. <laughs> Retrofitting is not prophecy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I lost the caller list. Uh, <laughs> but we have like uh, five more minutes, and that's not really enough time for Ahmed in Cairo, if this is really Ahmed. Making all those noises. Ahmed? Static. You know how Lindsay predicted this call would be disconnected. Yeah. <laughs> Eventually. Uh, John in Los Angeles. Hi, uh, I have a question for you. Okay. Do you believe that? Do you believe that um, if they got rid of the side effects of religion, would religion be bad? Because there are some countries that are uh, some of the safest countries in the world that um, are like one percent non-religious. So, which countries I, are you talking about? Uh, I'm sorry? Which countries are you talking about? Uh, Tuvalu. What? What? It's called Tuvalu. I think it's between Australia or you... somewhere. It's, it's an island, and it's like 1% non-religious. And there's, there's some more also. Uh, some Muslim countries are have a very low crime rate. So um, I need you to put your bias. You see, I'm an atheist, <laughs> by the way. I'm okay. Okay. So I need you to put your biased views to the side and put your agendas to the side and look at look at reality for what it is. Well, and, you're. And, and, uh, well, I mean, you're cherry picking one country. That's not the same as actually drawing yeah. a correlation between uh, the general religiosity of the country uh, and the low crime. You know what? In, in in order to make a claim, you have to explain the exception. If you cannot explain the no, you exception, don't. then what? you have to yes, no, yes, you do. No, if you, if no you, I don't think you question. I don't think you understand how science works. Exceptions are exceptions. They're considered okay, outliers okay. and they don't negate the entire okay, fine, pattern of fine. the data. Fine, I have a question for you. If somebody okay. claimed that a lot of blacks are dumb, but then they find a thousand very intelligent black people. So would you still say all blacks are dumb and just not even I wouldn't say all blacks are dumb people. at all. Yeah. Okay, so thank you then. So why are you saying all religious, all religious, all religion is bad? And, and all we don't and say why that. Are you you're, what you're doing, you're, it's we like don't say that, dude. Generalization. You're stereotyping. We don't you're, say you're that. Atheist, you're stereotyping. Dude, hey. dude, are you sure you're an atheist? 
Hey, how do you Thanks feel about? <laughs> hey, uh, how do you feel about gay marriage? Yeah. Uh, well, when you as far as gay Bye, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> For those who don't know, that guy's a frequent flyer here. <laughs> <laughs> and he can't, <laughs> he can't use his real name anymore because... Yeah, he <laughs> won't get past the call screener. Right. <laughs> um, Ryan in Indiana. Hello? Hi, Ryan. Hey, how's it going? Good. Great. Hey, big fan of the show. Um, I just wanted to call in to offer um, just a theory I've put together through uh, just a lot of research about the there being uh, just the possibility of what you know what we could call an afterlife through the release of DMT uh, by our brains when we die. Okay. Yeah, we've we've actually gotten a lot of email from people about DMT. Okay, and it's not a mystery that if you put a chemical in your brain, some chemicals can cause hallucinations and things that seem real. But that yeah. doesn't mean that those things are real. No, 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 I'm not saying that. I'm saying, um, well, let me explain. When, um, when we die, you know, we have accounts of people saying, we, you know, they see a bright white flash, you know, they see pictures of their family, their memories, you know, their life rolling through their eyes, which is, it's a great description of a hallucinogenic trip. And okay. we have evidence that shows that when we die, our brain releases a large amount of DMT. Actually, we don't have a lot of evidence of that. Well, everything I found shows that you know, we we do have that release of DMT, and okay. we do I, we do have evidence whether or not that we have a large release. We do have evidence that we do create in our brain, and it is used in REM sleep. Um, actually, most of the evidence that you're talking about comes from I think the guy's name is Strassman. Okay, and he's been doing experiments for something like 30 years. He hasn't been able to get any of this into mainstream evidence because nobody can replicate his results. So he's got a bunch of people, you know, taking hallucinogenic drugs and having these weird experiences and reporting this, and he's, you know... It, it has okay. nothing to do with taking, it has to do with our body creates it and makes it And there's itself. no evidence that our body can produce that amount of DMT at death or at any other time. Well, you, you know, it, there's no specific amount that is required. You know, you could take, there's no... If, well, they, if our brain creates it, it's a possibility. Well, they, we kind of have some information about what, how, to, how much DMT is required to oh, produce I, a hallucination. I would agree completely. I, you know, I, I don't okay. know whether you know, there is a certain amount. I'm just saying that there is speculation that we could say it's this speculation. is a possibility because of the effects of it. Okay, it's speculation. It doesn't mean that there's an afterlife, and it doesn't mean that anything that people experience when they're under the influence of DMT is actually real. It's something no. that's happening in your brain. Brain chemistry is weird. I think I need to clarify. I'm, I'm an atheist. I don't, it's not an afterlife. Um, I understand. In, in, in Actually, the, I'm, I'm afraid we're out of time. Uh, call back next week. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, but that's our show. And uh, thank you very much, Jen, for being here thank today. Uh, and thanks to Dale McGowan for being our guest. Very interesting stuff. Uh, and we will see you next week. And El Arroyo, not Threadgills this week. <laughs>